we got the blessing of a little bit of rain yesterday, which we always need. So we keep the island nice and green, and now the sun's out. And uh, as soon as we finish uh, with our general session this morning, and then the breakout sessions, then you're free to go out and enjoy the pool, the Moody Gardens, and everything else, OK? A uh, couple things real quick. Please, please complete your evaluation forms. I assure you the planning committee goes over those in great detail. And so we really appreciate your feedback. And anything we can do to improve for next year, we'd uh, like to hear it. And if some things went OK for you, you can put those in too, OK? Um, we really appreciate you attending this year. And uh, the participation has been wonderful. Um, this morning, we, uh, before we get started, I wanted to uh, introduce uh, Dean Ira Colby from the Graduate College of Social Work at the University of Houston. But the reason we really ask him is he's the immediate past president of the Council on Social Work Education. And we always uh, think that the experts have to come from out of state bringing a briefcase. I guess now they carry a laptop. But we have a national expert right here in Houston. And we also have a national expert right here in Houston who's just a mile or so down from the University of Houston downtown who will be our closing keynote speaker. So just because they're local doesn't mean they're not national experts, because they are, I can assure you. Um, it's been my pleasure to know Dean Colby for a number of years. And he's such a good man. He's quietly working behind the scenes. And I'll give you one quick example. Uh, last year, I called him and I said, we need to add one sentence to some federal legislation. And you're president of the Council on Social Work Education. Can we get together and I'll give you the one sentence? And it will solve the problem of penetration rates, cost, analysis, uh, cost allocation, all those things you all spend hours and hours uh, worrying about. And he said, sure, I'd be happy to meet you. He said, how about meeting for breakfast? This man goes nonstop, you know. And I said, great. And uh, <coughs> he said, <coughs> excuse me, I know a great place where they have fried chicken and waffles. <laughs> and I'm like, OK, uh, I like this guy. Uh, but I'll come and meet him there. So we met and had fried chicken and waffles. Mm -hmm. And uh, as usual, he was right. I also want to brag a little on him. The universe, if you have students who are looking to go to graduate school, you need to look at the University of Houston, central campus. You need to, if you have students who have their MSW and have done some good practice and you think would be wonderful in the classroom. Uh, a bunch of us are getting ready to really retire, Joe Papik. And so we need a new generation of faculty. We need a new generation of administrators that know how to r interpret data and do statistics. And so they have a wonderful PhD program there. And as a matter of fact, they have wonderful faculty. They're very prolific in publishing. And I want to share with you uh, one of the new books that Monique Chung just published. And she had to listen to me for the last three days complain that the publisher had yet to send me a copy. So I arrived home last night. I looked in the mailbox, and lo and behold, here's my copy, finally, uh, of the book. And I wanted to read to you just a brief review of the book. This book is a re rich treasure of critically needed information and research on child sexual abuse, with meet significant needs in social work, law, medicine, and other fields. So that's just a little review of this book. I don't know who this guy was that wrote this, but uh, it's a true story, a true statement. And so you want to get this book. It's, it's the latest research, and it's an, exa an example 
of the faculty of the, at the University of Houston. So without further ado, I'd like to introduce you to Dean Colby, who we're so blessed. He flew in from Washington, D.C. last night, got on this wonderful freeway I-45. Sometimes we call it a parking lot. Uh, to come down and join us this morning, and Dean Colby will introduce our keynote speaker. Dean Colby. Thank you. Thank you. Alvin, I need to take you on the road. I mean, my gosh. Thank you very much for your very kind introduction and comments about the College of Social Work, the faculty, and the things that go on, but it, this is a wonderful community to work in. Um, that's one thing I think we could say about Houston, Texas, the Gulf Coast region, and the state of Texas. We are trying to do things differently, and we, we were maybe one degree off center um, compared to other regions of the country, um, but that's how we become a very good state on behalf of all our children and families. I was thinking as a coming down here, uh, what a great day to come celebrate the, the first day of hurricane season right here in Galveston with y'all. How exciting is that? But what, what even trumped this, even though it's the first day of hurricane season, and I'm very disappointed to say, I don't know who set up the food outside, but today is National Donut Day. And to have Danish outside this room on National Donut Day is a disgrace. And so everybody in this room is obligated to stop at that donut shop that's on, when you go out, it's on your left-hand side going down to the main road to get out of here and buy a donut. Let's celebrate our national treasure, if you will. Uh, we're, we are very lucky to have a number of people in our community who are distinguished leaders um, in the field. And, uh, and we're very fortunate that this morning's speaker, Bob Hartman, is one of those individuals. Bob is the Executive Vice President and Chief Operating Officer for DePelchin uh, Children's Center. And as you know, DePelchin is a long-standing um, agency in our community that has provides very important services um, for children and families. And now they are branching out across the state with uh, programs in Austin, San Antonio, um, serving 25,000 families and children across the state of Texas. And that's the type of agency organization that does us proud in our field, because if it's not for our children, if our children do not have the opportunities to succeed, our future really, as you all know, um, is certainly will be bleak. Um, parts, and I asked Bob when, when I came in, I said, as I was driving down, I thought you just got here like three or four years ago, and this is how time flies, you know, all of a sudden you get to a certain age and it just goes real quick. And I said, no, he sort of got here when you got here, Ira, and I got here 13 years ago. And Bob said he got here 10 years ago, and it just seems like yesterday when Bob joined, uh, came to Houston. Um, came to us out of Kansas, where he was president and CEO of the Kansas Children's Service League, which was the first statewide contractor for child welfare privatization in the United States. As CEO of the Kansas Children's Service League, he had a staff, a small staff of around 500 people and a minor budget of $54 million that he had to supervise. Um, he grew the service league by 1,000% as the major provider in its privatization of child welfare services. Among his many accomplishments there in Kansas, and we've seen much of his work here as well, was uh, creating the Kansas Child Abuse Prevention Council. He established the Kansas Child Service League Foundation in 1998. Um, and then he also created the Kansas Innovations Incorporated in 2001. In addition, Bob, you know, a person like Bob serves on any number of state national committees. And if I read his resume, we'd be here for the rest of the morning. But just some key pieces. National Commissioner for the Council on Accreditation for Families and Children, which is important to many of us in this room a member of the National Advisory Board and Steering Committee of the National Child Traumatic Stress Network and co-chair of the network's Child Welfare Committee. And here in Texas, um, he was recently appointed to the Trauma-Informed Care Work Group for uh, DFPS and to the Supreme Court Permanent Judicial Commission on Children's Service Council. Any of you that have worked with Bob know you've got an incredible person here, somebody who's a thinker, somebody who's proactive and wants it to be a better place for children and families. And so it's a great pleasure for me to introduce and welcome, and please join me in welcoming good friend, good colleague, MSW social worker, Bob Hartman. Good 
Dr. Colby, thank you. Good energy. Get started. Um, where's the donut shop? <laughs> um, last night we had uh, the opportunity to have uh, a light dinner with, uh, uh, with uh, Sally's, and uh, it was just a, a real lovely time. And um, uh, Monique Chung was there. And I, I think Patrick Long mentioned that he wrote that review in the book uh, for so. A um, little bit about Ch uh, Depulsion Children's Center, uh, if I may, just briefly. Yes, it's a, a long-established organization, 120 years in our community. Uh, today we are serving every night about 700 children in foster care. Uh, so it takes a lot of foster homes to support these kiddos that are uh, in care. Uh, now in multiple regions around the state. First time, as Dr. Colby mentioned, that we've branched out of the greater Houston area, 13 county area, to, to um, incorporate services in, in other locations. Uh, we have two residential treatment centers, roughly 55, 60 kids. And these kids, uh, with about 98% of our census from the CPS system, have, as you know, the kinds of kids who've been multiple placements, higher levels of care, and need intensive support to be able just to to survive in in, a, in another home-like setting someday. We also uh, years ago merged with the Houston Child Guidance Center and became the the largest mental health services outside of the state uh, Department of uh, Mental Health here. In the area, and we have mental health clinics around the city, and these mental health clinics also support our kids in foster care, adoption, post-adoption services, residential care, etc. We have training programs as well. We're really fortunate to work with the uh, University of Houston as a field placement site for MSWs and, and BSWs, especially the MSWs. And uh, U of H now is part of a consortium, a national consortium uh, that um, is out of Fordham. University and Hunter College uh, that has a curriculum on trauma-informed care that uh, they're supporting MSW students to learn about trauma-informed care and then use sites like Depelchin as a field placement opportunity. So I just wanted to preface that because uh, some of my comments will, you will hear some of the themes of some of the kids that we're working with um, in, in this, this presentation. After harm, hope. Um, here is an area that has been devastated by hurricanes and there's a lot of harm and a lot of hurt that occurs in something as horrific as that. Kids in foster care have been through multiple hurricanes in their lives and yet every day we see some marvelous stories of hope. Uh, this title is not original we have an adoptive parent, <clears throat> uh, I'm sorry, an adoptive child who grew up, became an advertising exec, and owns his own business called Savage Design. And he has created a little booklet for us that we give to uh, people interested in adoption services to talk about the adoption process. While I'm talking, we can just pass this around if you'd like to glance at it real quick. After Harm Hope is the title that he gave us for this little booklet, if you would, please. Thank you. I'm going to share with you a number of stories. Myra came to us several years ago. Um, she is now graduated, as you see, has moved on from Depelchin. This is an incredible 180 degree turnaround for a child who had been in 20 locations before coming to Depelchin. Sexual abuse, running away, she was a cutter. When she came to us, she had had um, multiple hospitalizations within the year that she was here. So she came to us as intensive psychiatric transition uh, program placement and this is a highest level of care need that we have here in in uh, the state of Texas 
Um, you see the trees in the background? She is actually, this picture is taken from a branch of a tree. Because when she came to us, rather than running away, uh, fortunately we we're on a 19-acre campus just outside of the uh, greater uh, Houston area, uh, downtown area, and we have a lot of trees there. And to run away, essentially, from any pressure from kids, any pressure at school, her own internal, pressure, she would climb a tree and stay there for hours. It was very difficult for us to try to get her to, to um, engage. She wouldn't talk to people until one of our staff members looked up in the tree and saw her and said, Myra, you don't have to run away anymore. Baby, you can come down from the tree you can trust me. She thought about it. She climbed down from the tree and something happened to her when she hit the ground. She went with the staff member, went back into the school, and she became a star student for us. We have a contract with the University of Texas Charter Schools that has campus program, special ed, like, like our um, program at uh, DePelchin. And uh, she started advancing her, her work through the Odyssey software and uh, caught up to the class level that she was going to be in and eventually graduated. Her hope and her dream is to go into psychology and help kids like her turn their lives around. You may not know that Oprah Winfrey was sexually abused when she was a young teen, and she was passed around to different family members as well. She found hope, she became well-grounded, and she has supported children's uh, causes for a number of years. You know, we often forget when we're thinking about kids in care that it's just so hopeless. We often think, oh gosh, their trajectories are, are awful. And yes, the outcomes of kids aging out of care, who is like Oprah Winfrey, really? Uh, but, and she had a lot of resilience. She, I'm sure she had a lot of support as well. And yet it, it, it really, um, something clicked for her as well. That we forget that, that people go on and lead regular lives and successful lives as well. Um, we've been able to learn a lot over the last several years about child traumatic stress. And yesterday we presented a, a conference uh, workshop uh, together. Camille Gilliam uh, from uh, Lubbock, uh, Regional Director Dan uh, Sapaw, who is uh, Director of Administration at, uh, in a central office of uh, Department of Family and Protective Services. We were talking about trauma, and let me just ask you all, how many of you are beginning to weave into your curricula trauma-informed care? Okay. We're just now beginning to see the field catch hold of this, and we'll be talking about this a little more. So what is child traumatic stress? What's the big deal about it? What's, why, why is it different in what we're looking at uh, about kids now that have been in foster care? So we've known that they've been abused and neglected for a number of years. Uh, these slides will be available on, uh, online after, after the conference is over. Um, this slide says, and there are different descriptions of it, it's a reaction that a child has uh, to something very large that has happened to them that invades their peace, invades their sense of safety, and it is so overwhelming that it creates an inability to cope with life. Now, it's more damaging that over time if there are multiple um, traumas, but we can talk about some of this. Many of you have served in the child welfare system before becoming educators, before becoming trainers, been supervisors as well. And you know that some of these kids might come into care after they have witnessed domestic violence. 
after they have been perhaps abused themselves, then they are removed from the only caregivers that they know. They're typically their mother. And pulled away from a, a sense of security in their own home. Even though it is bad, that is still a sense of security for them in their home. They're pulled away from school, they're pulled away from friends, pulled away from pets. That is traumatic. Um, other sources of stress, as you all also know, that actually have higher incidence of kids who come into the child welfare system, as I believe Alvin mentioned the other day, if a child is in poverty, they're 22% more likely to come into the out-of-home care system. Poverty, discrimination, um, frequent place placements is another kind of stress that kids have. Uh, we're seeing a number of uh, kids, especially in Texas, who have come from other countries, from war-torn situations, and, and that also creates a traumatic event. So what are the effects of the trauma, traumas that we see on kids? It affects their entire developmental system, their, their brain development. Their, um, uh, it actually affects their internal biology and resistance to diseases. It affects their relationships, their, and you, we've heard a long time about the attachment that kids find difficult to have attachment with uh, even close caregivers if they've been uh, traumatized often early in life. Um, their cognitive skills. My wife is a, a teacher in middle school and uh, she often sees, of course, middle school, I mean, those kids are, sometimes their cognitive development is questionable anyway. <laughs> but they'll just blank out or they'll do their work and they won't even turn it in. And later she'll find out the story of that family. And the family is a uh, father, uh, is caring for several kids, uh, grandfather recently died. I mean, these are traumatic events that affect a child's functioning in school to focus, to, to uh, stay with the work. But what's different about trauma is that it's actually much more powerful than just uh, lack of focus or, or turning uh, into a middle school student. Um, you probably have seen these slides in some uh, book before. Uh, Dr. Bruce Perry, who is actually from Houston, now he's been all over the world, he's a world expert. It was only in the mid-90s that he began looking at brain scans, and he also worked with uh, Dr. Bessel van der Kolk. Uh, that, uh, I have a slide here uh, that he has stayed, stated a couple of things I want to share. Uh, but together, out of Harvard and, and uh, MIT area, they were looking at brain development for little children who have experienced trauma. And it actually shows that the, the brain... I heard him speak at a conference, at the Child Abuse Prevention Conference in Kansas, and he had on the podium a large orange and a large grapefruit showing the relative size difference uh, of a child's brain who had been traumatized much smaller uh, compared to a normal three-year-old. Now there's a lot more that happens to the brain. It's the synapses, the fire, the connections, the uh, ability to, to translate um, uh, and to uh, regulate emotion as well. But you know, to see it in a slide like this is so powerful compared to what we see daily in just behavior, behavior as social workers. With the brain of an adolescent, and I don't know if those two concepts actually go together, but the adolescent, and we sure see it at the uh, residential centers and in our foster homes where kids run away from care, really for the slightest incident that might occur, the tension that occurs with the uh, kids in the foster home and they're not accepted or somebody will say something about their mother or they'll say something that is a trigger from a prior incident and they see red and cannot control themselves. So you see adolescents uh, 
making very hasty decisions and actually put themselves in very unsafe situations because of the trauma that they have experienced, their inability to uh, control their, their relationships, their focus in school, uh, and, then, and then the other uh, activity as well. Dr. Sandra Bloom, who developed the, um, the model called a uh, trauma-informed model for residential care called the sanctuary model. She's out of Pennsylvania. There's somebody here from Pennsylvania who uh, actually, yes, that uh, has met her. I love her statement, hurt people hurt people. Now this is true in our own child welfare systems when we hire people who haven't gotten over their hurts. Many people are attracted to care for others if they have been hurt earlier and if they haven't healed, uh, we, we exacerbate a problem by hiring people who aren't ready to care for others. I, I just love that statement and it, to me it reminds me of a boy who recently graduated from our school. Albert is quite a story. Uh, he came in what is called at the intense level. There are four different levels in, of, of care in Texas. The psychiatric intensive, intensive transition program is the kind of the fifth. Very few kids are in this. This boy came in at the intense level and he had a probation officer uh, connected uh, with him, kind of a crossover youth is what we call them. He, um, he had been in so many fights. Uh, he, was, he was banged up, he had had broken bones, and he has, he has hurt so many people in his life. He is so angry and so ready to fight anybody who would say anything to him. I have no idea why we accepted placement of Albert. <laughs> our staff were saying, we can't work with this. He's going to upset our entire residential program for boys. How are we going to do this? We got on the phone and in our intake process I actually talked to him and he said, you know, I'm kind of tired of fighting, but I want to be in a safe place. So we were sold. We thought, well, maybe we could work with him. Um, Albert started the first three months fighting and then he gradually with a little coaching and support and, and skill development was able to rechannel his, his behaviors into push-ups, sit-ups, pull-ups and, and other ways to vent the, the intense physical uh, nature of what this trauma has done to him in his life. Um, we were ready at one point, and then he kind of stalled in care and wasn't making progress. He's out of, on a plateau. And then we had another boy who, who had also come in at the intensive psychiatric transition level who succeeded in school, went on to, um, to college at Sam Houston State, and Albert said, you know, I can do that. And in fact, he told his social worker, if I don't do it, nobody else can do this for me. All of our social workers, all of our youth care staff have been trained in trauma-informed care. We help the kids interpret what they're feeling, why they're going through this, this expressive inability to control their anger. And he eventually got a job with Prince Foods, who is a contracting uh, group that does our cafe depulsion that that uh, supports kids and does a catering for our, our staff. And um, he became a, just a, a food service person for Prince Foods. He is now uh, in a foster home that specializes in helping older kids age out of care uh, and get him a job in construction science. He couldn't even get into the military because of his, his fighting record and, and is, uh, is accosting people. So I was fascinated by the USA Today report just a few weeks ago. This is, um, says violence ages children's DNA. This study shows the exposure of kids to early violence and what it does. Violence, this is out of the um, uh, molecular psychiatry by Dr. Uh, Eden Shalev. 
Violence leaves long-term scars on children's bodies, not just in bruises on the skin, but also altering their DNA, causing changes that are equivalent to seven to ten years of premature aging. Um, Dr. Charles Nelson from Harvard Medical School said, this study confirms that early childhood adversity imprints itself, itself on our chromosomes. So, for so long we've been looking at kids' behavior and seeing what is affecting their safety and their permanence. And this issue of well-being is, you know, ill-defined, but we look at what the impact of trauma can be on kids and it's not their fault. It's what has happened to them. And that's what I'm excited about, what we're learning about trauma-informed care. Okay, let's bring it closer to home. In the child welfare system, it is amazing how kids have experienced so much more trauma than other kids and also other parts of our society. This says, a national study of adult foster care children shows that foster care alumni were, had higher rates of PTSD, 21%, than veterans returning from foreign wars. The other one says, nearly 80% of abused children face at least one mental health challenge by age 21. Well, we know that uh, kids over age five or six, uh, about 40% of our kids are uh, seeing the support of psych psychologists and psychiatrists, and that doubles the rate in our society, we, in, our, in our outpatient clinics, this doubles the rate of of need for that kind of service compared to kids in the community who have mental health challenges. And I can show you that. You cannot see this easily from where you're sitting, but when you get the slide you can look at this. We studied uh, 249 uh, kids in our foster care program. We have a research and grants management uh, group on our staff. And they were looking at uh, the trauma screening tools that kids coming into care, we do a screening of, of kids that uh, had trauma. 42% of foster care clients reported exposure to more than one trauma. Um, in, comparison to, in comparison, foster care clients, I'm sorry, of the 249 clients screened, 98% screened positive for trauma exposure by their own admission. And, in, and foster care clients reported six times the rate of exposure to neglect and more than two times the rate of exposure to physical maltreatment than the kids in counseling. And the importance of this, we have read studies for years that neglect is so much more damaging to a child's psyche than is even uh, child abuse and sexual abuse. So uh, we're, we just, we mirror the national averages. Well, Mercer Mayer, talked about this and when we were reading to our kids when they were growing up this there's a nightmare in my closet funny little book and it helps kids go to bed at night uh, you know they think that there's a nightmare I remember running and jumping across the room diving into bed because there's always a tiger underneath the bed and afraid but I mean those are those are childhood imaginations and those will happen but Doggone, the kids that we uh, work with have experienced, and I love to read this, this Ina Hughes poem. It's in Marianne Wright Edelman's uh, book, and I'll, I'll show you that. We pray for children who don't have any rooms to clean up, whose pictures aren't on anybody's dresser, whose monsters are real. We pray for those whose nightmares come in the daytime who will eat anything, who aren't spoiled by anybody, who go to bed hungry and cry themselves to sleep, who live and move but have no being. I once was um, over a couple of shelters in Kansas at this Kansas Children's Service League, and a police officer brought in three little kiddos, four years old, two years old, and an infant. The four-year-old and two-year-old had gauze bandages around their hands. And I mentioned in the workshop yesterday that uh, the policewoman told us the mother was teaching the kids to experience hot and they, she put their hands on the stove, the burners, and 
apartment people answered the screams and police picked them up and brought them to our shelter. These kids looked like they had no being. They were just blank. They were in shock and they had been traumatized and it was, they, they did some things that were just so erratic that uh, you would not, you would not uh, believe the impact of, of that experience. She goes on to say, we pray for children who want to be carried and for those who must, for those we never give up on and for those who don't get a second chance for those we smother and for those who will grab the hand of anybody kind enough to offer it, like these, two little, these three little kiddos, from the measure of our success. Child welfare system. This chart is traumatizing itself. Um, if you could see the line drawing here, on the left-hand side is the sphere of support for a child in a child's home. When a critical event occurs, and as you know, the child is, is removed from the home, all of a sudden this child is exposed now to a whole series of events and people in that child's life that have some decision-making authority, some connection new in the child's life. Police officers, maybe EMTs, the CPS worker, the court service staff, the, the judge, um, if it's a school-aged child, the new school, uh, probably the medical center, uh, maybe the uh, assessment center for forensic um, uh, review. This and the mental health, it just, it just goes on and on. And we see this now the child welfare system is really a misnomer. We are a system of systems. I guess you would say that we are a galaxy. And the child welfare systems have to negotiate with other systems that have different goals, different funding streams, different terminology, um, different political pressures. This is what you are having to deal with when you are training and teaching people about the care of kids. It's not a static, standalone, single organization. So we really have uh, an upward battle to try to eliminate the gaps that get created in these system connections. Charlotte's Web, I love this, E.B. White, we read these to our kids. Although it is made of thin, delicate strands, the web gets torn every day by the insects that kick around in it, and a spider must rebuild it when it gets full of holes. Well, that's our role. We're the spiders having to rebuild this, this web of support so, so that all of us are talking together to care for kids. Well, you all are familiar with legislation, historic legislation, rather than going back too far on uh, all the different pieces of legislation. There are multiple uh, attempts by Congress and, and state legislatures to, to um, help children in foster care and help us do this work. The ASFA legislation uh, back in 1997 set up uh, a couple of new pieces in our work. That policy moved from just safety for child protection to permanence, and especially permanency uh, was the major area of focus where the uh, courts then had timelines to bring kids before them to try to keep kids from being in permanent managing conservatorship or long-term foster care. This issue of well-being has been pretty ill-defined and um, Administration of Children and Families uh, established the, um, the CFSR reviews to try to hold states accountable to achieve these as, as uh, you all know. Um, but then realizing that there's more that has to happen here, Congress in 2001 uh, approved support for SAMHSA, Substance Abuse Mental Health Service Administration, to develop a National Child Traumatic Stress Initiative. This has been a marvelous opportunity here. It's only been now 10 years or so, and as Dan mentioned in our workshop uh, the other day, the CDC has uh, done a study to show when new interventions are developed, it takes a field 20 years to finally saturate the work and 
and make it implemented on a broad scale. And we're seeing that here today. When I ask you about how many people are talking about trauma in your curricula, uh, perhaps 20% of us right now. Hopefully that'll, that'll grow. To raise the standard of care and improve access to services for traumatized children. Uh, Sandra Bloom also said, organizations like individuals can be traumatized and the result of that trauma is very similar to what we see with the impact on on kids. It's the impact on the organization itself. Our work in seeing these kids and reading their case files and experiencing a child death in our mm -hmm. caseload is traumatizing to us as well. And it impacts how we all interact together as a system. You see this, it's a stress system. Uh, worker stress, manager stress, uh, the, uh, all the external uh, policy issues that we have to deal with. Well, trauma impacts our ability as social workers, case managers, supervisors, to make appropriate decisions about safety and risk for kids. We're liable if we're too burned out to make hasty decisions or to rely on policy, etc. I'm not going to go through this list, but um, another list we could also spend time with, even at our tables, thinking about the impact of trauma and how, how does trauma affect safety for a child in care? How does it affect uh, the ability to move a child to permanence? Uh, and also, certainly, uh, the well-being. Here's another slide when you get your, uh, your um, PowerPoint in front of you. How many people have seen the Milwaukee study that the University of Illinois did several years ago? Milwaukee Child Welfare System, here's the, I think one or two people, uh, studied 679 children entering and exiting a permanent home within a year. This graph shows at the bottom, bottom, bottom bar graph that if a child has one stable worker a child is over 70% likely to go home within the year. Two workers. It's less than 15% to go home within a year. Three workers for this child and it's 4.6%. So a stress system impacting the stress of, of workers uh, can then certainly affect the outcomes we're trying to achieve for kids on a, on a daily basis. Um, the Part of the NCTSN, the National Child Traumatic Stress Network, has a child welfare committee. I've been a co-chair uh, for this uh, committee for a number of years. And this is, a, this is a sort of an abbreviated look. It's, we have a longer statement than this. But it shows that what is a trauma-informed child welfare system? And it's, it's people who understand what trauma is and apply it daily through their policies, through their training, through their, their funding practices, helping of professionals, understanding the trauma of the, the parents themselves who have been traumatized and the impact then of going into court and what we're asking these families to do to be aware and responsive and then to use available scientific practice of evidence-based interventions that have been developed now that can reverse the toll of the traumas in kids' lives. There have actually been brain scans that are showing that some of the implementation of, of trauma-informed interventions can actually reverse these physical and mental health cycles that I mentioned earlier. So. I'm very excited that the University of Houston is uh, incorporating that into uh, the master's program here. Now, when we're working in the child welfare system, Dr. Zeus knew that we also can't forget the little kids. A person's a person no matter how small. We need a sense of urgency to get these little kids home. Cedric McKenzie would say, we need a, a sense of urgency for all kids. And that's so true. But the impact on a little child is even greater. Uh, there are studies showing that if you're able to 
connect a, a little child under three with mother 24 hours after placement and have multiple contacts throughout the week, you're better able to train the parent again to parent and to care and the, the child doesn't lose that attachment bond and is able to go home quicker. And I'm, I'm excited here in Houston, we were one of, I mean, uh, Texas, we're one of the early sites in the uh, zero to three initiative for court improvement teams that uh, we're pushing. Here's another book I love, Good Night Moon. How many of you read this, this book? You've ever read it to children or grandchildren? What this says to me by Margaret Wise Brown, um, I remember reading this and our kids just wanted to read it over and over and over. They felt safe with this book. It says, good night, comb, good night, lamp, good night, mittens, good night, kittens. And it, it just sort of repetitious, it just, I fell asleep rocking the kids uh, reading this book. But over and over and over, our children wanted to read this book. Their room, their sense of safety. I mentioned Dr. Bessel van der Kolk. He said, the first step towards healing is to help a child that has been traumatized to feel immediately and absolutely safe. That's the first step towards healing. Well, there's a lot now beginning to be written and uh, policy statements uh, designed to uh, design a trauma-informed system of care. The next few slides are some administrative types of steps we can take. This was a part of the, uh, the uh, American Association of Behavioral Health Administrators who put this together. It really requires an intentional effort. Your efforts to provide training is a piece of the puzzle. It isn't it isn't enough yet to fully implement a trauma-informed care. And you, you really need a policy level statement. You need a, um, a group at the top who are saying, this is important, we're going to incorporate this into practice, we're going to make it so that supervisors can support staff with this, so that it sustains the policy and the practice. It's in our workforce recruitment process as well and how we go through our hiring uh, procedures. I mentioned earlier, uh, we have now at Depelchin actually through uh, a company called Presidium Inc. Out of, out of the Dallas area. Presidium has a whole uh, range of, of um, policies, training, practices, monitoring, supervision, uh, uh, etc. processes that you can implement uh, in your organizations that help you in your hiring practice, help you in your uh, supervision practice. We've even changed the questions we're asking candidates to, to be in a job so that uh, we're not uh, attracting those people who we feel that would make a child unsafe, who, who are not ready yet to care. Another administrative policies and guidelines, financing is critical. Uh, uh, clinical practice guidelines, policies, procedures, assessing children for trauma, as you saw a slide earlier, and evaluating that to see how many kids are, have experienced this and, and what does that mean for our work. And then trauma-related services. In addition to the screening and assessment, uh, trauma-informed care that is um, following evidence-based practice. When you get some new initiative like this started, we might be all on fire to do trauma-informed care or to start teaching it, but the mental health field then is lacking in the numbers of people trained in trauma-informed care. <clears throat> it, but it takes, as Liz Shore mentioned in Within Our Reach, it takes very intentional effort to replicate successful activity for a new program. Has anybody read this book, Within Our Reach? Liz Shore uh, was in the Carter administration. Uh, this is the wife of Daniel Shore, the, the uh, CBS uh, common commentator. Um, she... Oh, really? Oh, maybe that's why she got into social work. 
Um, Liz Shore wanted to study what is working well, and she went around to different organizations and, and captured a number of ways that successful organizations and successful programs were implementing their services. Five years later, she went back and realized that almost 50% of those very successful programs were not being replicated anywhere. In fact, most of those had, had uh, gone away. They lacked the administrative support, they lacked the training, they, la they lacked the policy support that it required to, to um, uh, keep something like this going. So how do you lead change within a big system or a big organization? Establish a sense of urgency, form a powerful coalition, create a, a compelling vision, et cetera, et cetera, to institutionalize, to sustain this work. I am so excited about what's happening right now in, um, in Texas. We have recently appointed um, uh, Audrey Deckinger, the uh, Assistant Commissioner for uh, Child Welfare Services, appointed a uh, task force that's statewide and multidisciplinary to develop trauma-informed care at all levels of the Department of Family and Protective Services. On this task force includes the uh, Permanent Judicial Committee uh, ca uh, Commission of the Supreme Court on Children. On this committee also is uh, the Managed Care Mental Health Provider in the state of Texas. It's first, first in the country that's a statewide mental health and, be, and uh, a primary health care provider of kids in foster care. And in fact, uh, Integrated Mental Health Systems, or Sympatico is they, what they call themselves, has set up a uh, preferred provider arrangement for mental health providers that if they go through trauma-informed care training, they will become preferred providers and they will fund the length of time and the numbers of sessions that the new trauma-informed implementation uh, um, services require. So that's, that's really exciting. So we're seeing now a, a, a range of, of universities, foundations, uh, get behind trauma-informed care and now forming a network to try to look at specific policies within the department and reaching out to CASAs, the courts, et cetera, to build this web of, um, of connection. And we're using some wonderful tools. The NCTSN, the National Child Traumatic Stress Network, has now multiple tools that are at our disposal, that are free, that are downloadable, that you can go to online. Just Google NCTSN. And they have, they have, we helped, I helped develop this uh, with our Child Welfare Committee. It's the Child Welfare Trauma Training Toolkit. Any of you using this in your training at this point? Great, we've got a few. Um, this Trauma Training Toolkit is directly uh, developed with and for the Child Welfare Case Manager going through the ASFA legislation of, of safety, permanency, and well-being and designing a case approach to address trauma-informed care for the child in care. It's now being implemented in multiple states and it's, it's really exciting because it's, it's, it's very helpful. Another resource that uh, just followed that is caring for children who have experienced trauma for those caregivers, the foster parents, the adoptive parents. We're now uh, creating one for kinship caregivers. We're looking at resources uh, for and about parents who have experienced trauma and, and uh, for, for judges and for uh, caseworkers as well. This is a, a um, design for pre-service. We've talked to the major curricula uh, organizations around the, the country like Child Welfare League of America um, and, and others who have uh, pride training and MAP training and other forms of, of pre and in-service training and they are beginning to incorporate many of these tools in this toolkit. 
The original draft of this was done by Sue Badeau out of uh, uh, Philadelphia. Sue was the commissioner of, of uh, child welfare of, of um, Philadelphia. She's now with the Casey Foundation. She and her husband have fostered over 50 kids and have adopted uh, 19 of those kids. So she's been in the trenches and she, she knows that. What can we do as educators? We can use these tools, we can advocate for learning communities around implementation of these tools. We can encourage collaborations with other partners, mental health, education, uh, etc. Here's another tool, treating traumatic stress in children and adolescents. Uh, Dr. Margaret Blaustein and Christine Kenneberg out of Boston have, have put together this new model. It is, it is evidence-based. It is shown that uh, in residential care facilities, like the sanctuary model, it's very effective in getting the entire staff to learn about trauma and to adjust their work to create bonds for kids that, that in, improve attachment, that improve self-regulation and emotional uh, control so that we no longer as staff have to exert control for for the kids lives so that it's more self control that the kids exert and also to have a sense of self competency and skill development to be able to um, um, uh, take the next step in life love this model so we see a stress system then that has tools and support and working together, hopefully then at some point in our child welfare history, we could look back and say, there was a turning point that these systems of care started caring differently for kids. And I kind of like to look at it as, this is, this is like a Scrabble board where you have two or three squares that you put into the highest point value and you can you can um, advance your score by just using a few building blocks for your Scrabble board. And that's kind of what I look at trauma-informed care for our, our system. Oh, I wish Cedric were here this morning. This is Alexander and the Terrible, Horrible, No Good, Very Bad Day by Judith Viorst. I wonder if he has read this. I am having a terrible, horrible, no good, very bad day. I told everybody, no one even listened. No one, no one answered. His book, She Never Answered, uh, really talks to what Judith Viorst has said. And essentially, what all this boils down to is what James said. Everyone should be quick to listen, slow to speak, and slow to become angry. You know, when we see kids in care, it's so quick to jump at an impression of what's happening to this child and get angry, and then they blow the placement and we start all over again and create so much difficulty in our caseloads. I also like this from the Old Testament, from Jeremiah. For I know the plans I have for you, declares the Lord, plans to prosper you and not harm you, plans to give you hope and a future. There are people that have survived foster care, survived horrible childhoods. Billy Mills from Kansas, he was a famous uh, mile runner uh, before uh, Jim Ryan actually, uh, was an Olympic uh, star. Uh, he started running to get away from kids at school who were beating him up and family members. Who, he was passed around to family members. He, he almost didn't even know who his family was because he went to so many different placements on an Indian reservation. He survived that. Several years ago, I had the opportunity to listen to Charlotte Ayana. She is now in movies and in uh, TV work, and she is a delightful speaker. She grew up in foster care. Uh, she and her, uh, her siblings uh, were placed, they're actually a Puerto Rican family out of New York. Uh, when she was placed in foster care, uh, she was told that, that um, all of her kids, her, her sisters and brothers, were too far away to connect with them, so she had no contact with her seven uh, brothers and sisters. When she was a teenager, she started excelling in school, 
uh, got into cheer and dance and music and she became a straight A student and she asked her she asked her caseworker why can't I be adopted I'm a good kid and she said I'm, I'm just gonna get adopted well she was 17 years old and her caseworker told her and this is something that somebody told Cedric as well and as he presented the other day you just have a wish and a dream you can hope all you want, but it's, it's, um, it's impossible. You're 17 years old, we're not going to find a family for you. I've got too many other kids on my caseload who are younger who are going to have a family. She didn't buy it, and she told this crowd of Child Welfare League of America um, attendees, I, she said, I went to the New York Times and I placed an ad saying, straight-A student, now, Miss Teen America wants a family. She, was, she interviewed families and found a family when she was 22 years old. Talk about permanence. And several years ago, Antoine Fisher came and spoke for our spring luncheon. <clears throat> Antoine Fisher's uh, very famous now because of the book Finding Fish and the uh, character in the movie that he that uh, he portrayed and Denzel Washington as the psychologist. Uh, kind of like Albert, he became a real fighter and uh, he became homeless and then uh, finally was able to turn his life around. He sat and talked to our kids in our residential uh, center and some of our foster kids and he has a real gentle spirit now and he has a passion to support kids who are hurting, who have been through this and, and has come out the other end. We tend to think that all these kids are monsters. I just love this one too. Max, the king of all wild things, was lonely and just wanted to be somewhere where someone loved him best of all. Maurice Sendak. You know, he, Maurice Sendak just died about three weeks ago uh, in his 80s. Well, so where does this bring us? What is the future going to look for us uh, as a field in child welfare? I have a lot of hope, actually. When we meet somebody like Cedric McKenzie, I have a lot of hope when we see a foster family like this foster mother he talked about step up and step into his life and care for him and took a chance with him. and. I have a lot of hope that you all are training a new generation of, of um, staff that are going to be in foster care and we're, with the data that uh, Patrick Leung and this whole network are showing, the, these people that you are training are staying longer in foster care, they have degrees in, child, in, uh, in social work, they're going to hang in there for the, for the long haul. Um, You know, Cedric's experience is very similar to what Paul wrote, that suffering produces perseverance, perseverance, character, and character, hope. He also wrote to the Corinthians, faith, hope, and love. So it's not just about hope. We really need to institutionalize an ability for us to love and to see the child differently. And I think through the trauma lens we're able to do that. So I feel like if this were, to me, a crystal ball is in front of us every day in foster care. In a child's eyes, I see a lot of hope if that child is able to trust again, is able to look at somebody with meaning and care for them and extend the care that has happened to them. We've all seen the other eyes dart around and not be able to focus and, and uh, look at you with contempt and, and anger or fear. But I do have hope that our vision for the future for child welfare, we can change this in a very different way for these kids. So I thank you for the work that you are doing every day to prepare our generation of people to create hope for our kiddos in foster care. Thank you for the work you do.
Bob, thank you very much for your leadership um, in, uh, in child welfare and, and in trauma care. And, and, my com and, and as you were speaking, I, I heard about trauma-informed care. And what you're saying now is we need to have trauma-informed care systems to really work. But then there, I, I just thought back, keep flashing back to that one slide where you have the systems and you talk about child welfare as being a system of systems in the galaxy. So therefore, the challenge is in front of us that we have to pick this up. If, in fact, we want to have a trauma-informed care system, then we have many systems that all of us and our students must go out to try to change and create that environment so care can actually uh, take place. Bob, on behalf of uh, the conference, I do have a small gift to present to you, if you would. Of course, they're re in uh, Houston, Red, uh, University of Houston. But Bob, thank you very much for your comments and your support. Thank you. Is we it a donut? Um, it's not a donut, but <laughs> thank you very much. Thank you. It goes. Now, those of you that aren't from Houston, and I know you have a break now, um, um, Elvin mentioned the, the waffles and the wings. That's called the Breakfast Club. If you are in Houston and you want an incredible experience, it's called the Breakfast Club. It's not with a C, it's with a K. Uh, you get there early because on the weekend there's a, uh, typically a 30, 40 minute wait in line, but it's well worth it. If you drive by, get in line. It will be the most incredible breakfast you've ever had, and wings go with waffles. I don't get it, but they do. Now, the second thing, if you are in Houston this weekend, and again, I work for the Chamber of Commerce, tomorrow night at Miller Theater, which is in Herman Park, it's the greatest concert, annual conference, uh, concert they have. It's the Accordion Kings. And they bring in um, accordion groups from Louisiana, from South Texas, and it's the most incredible night. And even if you don't dance, I'm a middle-aged, well, actually I'm an old white guy, I don't dance, but I dance with the accordion kings. It just grabs hold of you. It starts about 8 o'clock tomorrow night. It's free theater in um, Houston. So get your donuts today, go to the breakfast club tomorrow morning for waffles and wings, and then go dance it off at the accordion kings tomorrow night. Thank you all very much, Elvin. Uh, thank you um, as well. Thank you. Thank you, Dean Colvin. I appreciate that so much. Um, Bob, uh, that was a, a brilliant presentation, but I have one complaint. I had my syllabus for second summer session all ready to go. Now I have to go back and revise it. I had Cedric's piece in there, then with what David shared with us yesterday, and what you shared with us today, I'm not going to be spending any time on the beach. I'm going to be revising my syllabus. Thank you very much. I also wanted to share a couple more things uh, about Dean Colby. It was through his efforts that the University of Houston downtown developed our BSW program. And he understood the need for BSWs to do direct line work. And I think then they can go to UH and get their master's degree and doctorate degree later. So I, I've always felt like we are greatly indebted to you every day I go to work at UHD. The other thing I wanted to say is that I also serve on an executive committee for the Homeless Youth Network in Houston. And we were struggling with trying to understand more about who the homeless youth were and what we could do to, to work with them. And I suggested maybe we should go see Dean Colby and see if we could get a student intern to help do a little research. So Joe Levine uh, said, uh, well, let's go. I wasn't able to make the appointment. Joe called me afterwards and he said, now what's this thing called a postdoctorate? And I said, uh, he, Dean Colby wants to do that. And I said, you're kidding, it costs money. But that just shows the passion, the personal passion that Dean Colby has and his commitment to this. So now we're going to have a postdoc expert doing research on homeless youth in Houston and what we can do about it. And I appreciate that as well. So thank you all so much. You've been a wonderful audience. Mm -hmm.